for joining us. Thanks, Liz. Um, didn't know that you'd hear my voice doing these again. Jason Vandiver, ex Building Code Program Manager for Spear. Uh, happy to announce uh, Randy Plumley is taking over my position at Spear. Um, so shoot me an email and I'll, I'll be happy to get you in contact with him if you like. Um, excited to have Rusty Tharp uh, with us this morning. Uh, he, he's going to do the energy and refrigerant regulations again that um, we, we've done it a few months ago. Rusty's got a little different, uh, different, different information, uh, presents it a little differently. I, I think he does a really good job. I, I've seen him do, uh, do this before. So uh, Rusty, if you want to just introduce yourself uh, and the floor is yours, good sir. All right. Thank you very much. Again, Rusty Tharp. I'm the VP Regu Regulatory Affairs and Environmental Research for uh, Daikin Comfort Technologies. Uh, Daikin, uh, we used to be Goodman and we're officially renamed as Daikin Comfort Technologies uh, in April 1st. Uh, I've been in the industry for 36 years. I've worked for a couple other of the major manufacturers, spent 25 years in product design and development for uh, spent most of my time in residential AC and heat pump development, sometime in light commercial, and uh, spent the last 10 years doing regulatory affairs. Um, so uh, I've got a pretty full slide deck. I will hope try to do my best to keep this under an hour and give us uh, ample time for Q&A at the end. Um, some of the things that are in here are uh, copied from HRI Safe Refrigerant Transition Task Force. Um, so we'd ask that uh, anything that's uh, copied or pasted, uh, make sure we give appropriate uh, recognition to HRI for the information that comes from them. Uh, so the, the agenda that I'm going to go over uh, today is, um, first of all, I, I copied and pasted this Prezo from uh, something I did uh, for something else. And the first part is just real quick summary. I probably won't uh, fly through the DOE background process and then spend time on the uh, current and future regulations, uh, the refrigerant issues, and uh, some of the building codes and safety standard development that have, have gone into those things as we move towards new refrigerants uh, that are coming up. Um, so just as a real quick, uh, we are, so those of you who are old as I am remember the schoolhouse rock and the bill, just as a reminder that there's a, a certain process that the government has to go through when they're making rules, um, due processes, things that are in the fourth and fifth and 14th amendment, and there's a this process that in the middle, middle bullet that DOE and other regulatory agencies have to go through. So there's uh, pre-rule rate making, proposed rule, and final rule stages whenever uh, regulations are put into place. And most of these are done in what's referred to as a notice and comment process. And uh, there are other things that are done in negotiated rulemaking. And I'll get into a little bit more why, how that is a, a factor in, uh, in just a moment. Um, the Department of Energy, just a little quick uh, fact, is that the e DOE is actually one of the newest um, departments, uh, obviously the Department of Homeland Security, uh, but it was created, DOE was created in 1974, I'm sorry, 1977, and it was really California that had the first appliance efficiencies. And uh, going back, you know, historically, you see that there's uh, been a relatively steady change of um, regulations of how we do things and for DOE and uh, uh, actions that they take. So in, but this EPCA, uh, Energy Policy and Conservation Act, gives a whole lot of requirements for DOE, right? So there's, they define products, they define what DOE can and cannot regulate. It defines uh, the authority that DOE has for test procedures. From a general perspective, uh, DOE sets the is responsible for the residential product uh, test procedures. However, for commercial products, they have to use industry test procedures uh, if applicable and if possible. Um, but regardless of any, whichever route they choose, uh, there's certain things that they have to follow like the uh, process rule and having public comment periods and certain things that are as far as effectivity, like test procedures go into effect six months after a final rule and things of that nature. Uh, this EPCA also gives labeling requirements to FTC for the most part. So that's why the Energy Guide tag you see on the products is uh, regulated actually by Federal Trade Commission, not DOE. 
Um, but and the EPCA also gives DOE the authority to set the minimum efficiency levels uh, for a variety of products, with the exception that um, their DOE is statutorily required to adopt what 90.1 has for commercial products, unless they have some really good reasons not to adopt 90.1. Um, and so again, I, I mentioned the process rule. There is a defined procedure on how DOE goes about all this process. And uh, that, you know, that's my day-to-day -day life as far as uh, dealing with Department of Energy and their notices, notices of uh, determination, notice of data availability, request for information, manufacturer impact analysis. So there's a whole bunch of things that are in this uh, process rule as to how things are accomplished. I uh, won't go into that in detail now because um, we've got a lot more stuff to cover. Uh, for those who may have uh, problems sleeping at night, uh, I might recommend going to the uh, ECFR and looking at some of the regulations. Uh, there's a, a variety of regulations listed on screen as far as uh, how DOE regulates the products. Um, so there's 429, there's certification compliance and enforcement activities. Uh, so one of the things that's Im important is 429-104. You get into the end of the 429 series, there's, uh, as we move forward with the 2023 regulations, there's a fair amount of information on the enforcement aspect of what is, a, what is a violation and what is not a violation of federal laws, especially as it comes to uh, installation of products in the South. Um, and then there's also some regs in there. So the 16, the 10 series is DUE, the 16 series is FTC, and the 40 series is EPA. So that's just a real quick background on uh, DUE regulations. And we'll now jump into some of the things that are uh, upcoming with DOE. So the first thing is the test procedure changes. Um, so the this actually, all this changes that we're seeing that are going to affect in 2023 are the result of a negotiated rulemaking. I mentioned that earlier. The negotiated rulemaking was done in 2015. So they're uh, for about the last six months of 2015, bleeding over to early 2016. Uh, there was a group of stakeholders that met with DOE and developed a uh, proposed changes to the test procedure, which the DOE then published as final in 2017, and that is actually what goes into effect in 2023. Um, if you look at the, the two blue bullets, uh, the those are the primary things that affect the cooling mode, which also goes into the heating mode, so it's really the ducted products. The biggest change that happens is the, the test, the pressure that is you, the static pressure used for duct work during the testing. As the bullet the table, the column on the right shows, the current test procedure, which is referred to as DOE Appendix M, is uh, the static is very low, 0.1 to 0.2 inches of water column. So that's a pretty low duct static. Most people realize you know, there, there are applications out there at that low static, but not many, right? So most applications are much higher than the 0.1 or 0.2. So the agreement was that the majority of products are now tested at 0.5 inches, a half an inch water column, uh, which is more realistic of what happens out there. There are some products, for example, um, apartment style uh, air handlers, because they have typically have a much lower duct run, uh, those are actually gonna be tested at 0.3 static. And there's some other rules for multi-splits. Um, obviously ductless products are still tested at zero inches of static. Um, but because that duct static increases, that means there's increased power consumption on the indoor side, which leads to um, more measured energy, which uh, gives a lower test value. Uh, so the numerical values will decrease as a result of that. Um, going along with the duct, the duct static pressure for the systems that are rated without a blower, uh, like air conditioning plus a coil, the default watts go up to counteract the uh, the higher test static. So that those those two values there, those two um, options will are pretty significant in the measured value of the uh, air conditioning equipment as well as the heating and the heating mode for ducted. Now the red bullet points are the things that change for the heating side. And these are actually pretty significant also. Uh, let me see, let me go to the pointer options. So if you notice over here, the zero load point has actually decreased. Um, the test procedure used to say the calculations for HSPF were based upon a 65 degree zero load point, basically saying that you needed some heating at 65. 
that has now been changed to 55 degrees. And uh, the, the impact of that is this yellow square or this yellow triangle is no longer a portion of the HSPF calculation. And what that does is, as everyone should likely aware, the higher the ambient, the more efficient a heat pump is. So therefore, in this high efficiency operation, it is removed from the calculation for HSPF. Uh, this will also, that has an impact of reducing the measured value, the measured efficiency of the uh, heat pump. The next big change is the heating load line. So this blue line is a typical uh, building load that is in the current M test procedure. And the orange and gray lines are the new building load lines from the appendix M1 test procedure. And uh, this red dotted line, dashed line, is a typical unit capacity. And so as, you, uh, as everybody knows, the capacity of the heat pump decreases as the outdoor ambient decreases. And so the net impact of this um, heating load line change is this purple zone is now electric heat that's added to the calculation. So when we calculate the efficiency by HSPF in the heating mode, um, today, just this spot, uh, this space under the blue curve down to the red curve is electric heat. So you can see we're almost doubling the calculated amount of electric heat that is in input into the HSPF calculations. Uh, there's a couple other uh, changes to the test procedure. Uh, one is the compressor speeds. The compressor speeds used to be uh, sort of separated for heating and cooling, but now uh, the heating speeds are driven by what you do in the cooling mode, as well as at the low temperature uh, 17 degree test. Um, also, there's a new option to run a five, test at five degrees, which is good for variable speed product because since variable speed can be oversped, you can go to like a boost mode, uh, that's actually should be helpful to uh, provide a better uh, rating for the variable speed products. So the net result of those changes is that the um, SEER 2 values, so the new, the new values have just a number two added to the end. Uh, so if you look at this left table over here, the SEER values, um, for ducted systems, you're going to see about a 5% decrease in the measured value. So what was 14 will now be about 13.4. What was 16 is going to be about 15.2. Um, but one of the things that you'll note is that because the big change is the ducting, the duct static pressure, that there won't be a change in ductless values. So what this will do is actually will make ductless look better relative to ducted systems. So that's takeaway number one. Um, and then again, the takeaway number two is that for all the cooling metrics, both SEER and ER, you'll see roughly a 5% decrease in the numbers for ducted systems, but no change in the ductless. Uh, then when we, get, when we get to the HSPF, the heating numbers, um, you're going to see some very significant decreases. And I think this is one thing that may cause some confusion among stakeholders in the field is that these uh, numbers, when you used to have like eight, nine, 10, uh, the numbers are going to be significantly smaller, right? So a 8.8 .8 HSPF is relatively equal to a 7.5 HSPF2 uh, for a split system and then 7.4 for a duct uh, package product. And when you get to ductless, it's still a decrease, about 5%, but not, um, so not as significant for ductless. But the takeaway from this slide is that all the numbers are dropping down so, but even though you may have a slightly higher number, uh, like for the air conditioners, 13.4 uh, SEER 2 uh, is equal to a 14 SEER. So just be mindful of that. Um, the next takeaway, this chart is what the new minimum efficiencies are. Uh, bear with me one second. Um, and, if you notice the uh, heat pumps, just like today, heat pumps are a national standard. And so the split, split system heat pump, the new minimum is going up to 14.3 SEER 2, which is equivalent to about a 15 SEER. As a general rule of thumb, we can just say that the SEER level is bumping up approximately one SEER across the board for the split systems, but it actually stays the same for single package products. 
so for split heat pumps, it goes up to 15 SEER, which is really 14.3 SEER 2 and a 7.5 HSPF2. Um, the package products, both AC and heat pump, remain at a 14 SEER, but the new level is a 13.4 SEER 2. Uh, for the Southwest and air conditioners, and again, when we get to the air conditioners are subject to regional standards. Um, we do have a, a minimum EER requirement for the Southwest, which doesn't affect you folks from uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Um, but when we get to split systems, there is uh, obviously just like today, there's a north region, a southeast region, and a southwest region, and the minimum efficiency goes up one SEER point, um, but converted to SEER 2. So you get a 13.4 SEER 2 for the north, which is equivalent to a 14 SEER. Uh, for the southeast, which is us, uh, Texas and Oklahoma, we'll have a 14.3 SEER 2 minimum for three and a half ton and less and 13.8 SEER 2 for four and five tons. So this is actually gets a little bit more confusing uh, than the current regional standards because there actually is a capacity split now for the SEER levels. Um, and then if things are really complicated for the Southwest um, because there's a minimum ER requirement, which actually gets lower if you have a higher SEER. So I'll just leave the numbers there and, and due to uh, time constraints, won't go into the juicy details there. Um, but what I want to do note is again, that the regional standards, so let's go to this top box. The regional standards are only applicable to air conditioners. So heat pumps are not a uh, subject to regional standards. The regional standards are also really only applicable to the Southwest and Southeast. The products in the North really don't, even though it's a minimum in the North, you can still uh, sell and install anything in the north. But these regional standards for the southeast and southwest are based upon date of installation. So, for example, if you've got a 14 SEER product today, that 14.0 SEER product becomes illegal to install in the southeast and southwest as of January 1st, 2023. And this third bullet point is the DOE requirement is that in order to meet the new spec for the South, for the read one regional standards, every combination has to meet or exceed. So when you've got a split system, if all combinations but one are above the 14.3 SEER 2 level, and you've got one combination below 14.3, that outdoor unit cannot be installed in the Southeast. So uh, we'll get into the STC regs there in a little bit that'll help understand that. But again, um, Going down then to the bottom box here, DOE has a definition of installation. And as noted on the screen, I think you guys can read that, so I won't go into it. But basically, you got to have everything connect, connected up and pretty much be able to run the system to be deemed to be uh, installation. Uh, so this next table just compares the current values to the future values. Again, if you look for the most part, single package product stays the same at 14 um, for both AC and heat pump. Um, and then the split systems all go up by roughly one point. Again, there, but then there's the capacity break on the uh, four and five ton where he only goes up half a point. Um, rushing through here, we go to the FTC guide. So when we get to the 2023 regs, um, hopefully this graph will, this table will make it easy to understand uh, what complies or doesn't comply. So, the manufacturers will be, our, we're all manufacturers are introducing a whole lot of new products for 2023 with the SEER 2 ratings. And, it, and you can go to the HRI directory today and go look at the SEER 2 or SEER ratings. Um, you can differentiate there's on the search page. You can uh, choose which ones you want to search for. Um, but the FTC guides actually make it fairly easy to determine compliance. So if the values on the energy guide label are SEER 2, so again, the, this column is for anything that has SEER 2 on the energy guide label, it's easy. If, if it has a map, you follow the map as to where the unit can be installed. If there is no map, then national installation is okay. And again, these are if the rate ratings are SEER 2 or E or 2, HSPF 2. If you've got an old product that is uh, M rated, then you have to look at the numbers that are on the old uh, energy guide chart. Uh, in this particular case, you cannot look at the map. And 
If the, for one and a half to three and a half ton, if it's above 15, then it's okay for the Southeast and Southwest. Um, the Southwest, you also have to meet these ER requirements uh, for four and five ton. It's gotta be the 14.5 SEER or 11.7 uh, ER for the Southwest. So if you look at this, this should make it relatively easy to determine whether a product is compliant or not for the uh, regional standards after January 1st, 2023. So along with these changes, obviously, uh, because DOE is changing the metrics, EPA has changed the Energy Star requirements. Um, the today's requirements are basically 12.5 EER and 16 and 15.0. SER, and they're basically bumping those up. They're keeping the ER requirement roughly the same, but the SEER requirement is going up roughly one point of SEER. So it's the actual value requirement is 15.2 SEER 2, um, but they're in a 12.0 SEER ER 2, sorry, um, the values you can see on screen. Um, but these are Energy Star 6.1 requirements. Um, and the point, the one thing to be uh, note is that effective December 31st, uh, after December 31st, the products that are presently certified as Energy Star to version 5.0 will no longer be Energy Star. So anything effective, uh, anything produced after 1 1 2023 has to meet these new values to be Energy Star. So I know there's a lot of uh, um, so that addresses the, the top three bullets here. Going to the bottom bullet, I know there's a fair amount of programs, uh, rebates, et cetera, that are based upon the CE tier levels. Uh, my understanding is that the CE tier levels are not changing. Uh, so we've got the tier one, which is today equivalent to the Energy Star uh, 5, 5.0. And then there's a tier two and a tier three, which is basically 16. Tier two is 16 SEER and tier three is 18 SEER. Those tier levels are not changing, but are going to be crosswalked. So uh, see, oh, we expect CE will be uh, publishing something in the not too far distant future, which will give us a crosswalk from the SEER ER HSPF values to the SEER 2 ER 2 HSPF 2 values. Um, so that, that so far gets us through the residential energy changes. Uh, there's also upcoming uh, DOE commercial changes that go also go into effect January 1st of 2023. Um, and the, the big takeaway, so this table shows what the new values are. Uh, the, the first takeaway from this table is that the values are the same as ASHRAE 90.1 2019. So the we have a good alignment with the, fed, the federal regulations for 2023 you are basically adopting what was in the uh, 90.1 values. And it's roughly a 15% increase in efficiency based of over what is allowed today. There was a DOE change, minimum efficiency change, um, where the IER became the federally regulated metric for these products in 2018. This is the second step. Again, this was a negotiated rulemaking that was done back in 2015 that has created this change. Um, just within the last couple of weeks, DOE has also published a new notice of proposed rulemaking um, where there's a, another negotiated rulemaking that is just getting started. We'll actually we'll begin meetings next month where there's going to be similar changes to HRI 340, 360 test procedure um, where we're going to adjust test statics and other factors uh, in the test procedure. And uh, there will also be new energy conservation changes. Now, these are this is coming down the road. Um, probably won't go into effect until January 2029. Um, but the key takeaway is that there's a lot of changes coming. Um, not only is there going to be changes in the commercial RTUs going into effect in 2023, um, but the um, VRF systems are also going to have some changes coming up in a little over a year. So there was another negotiated rulemaking that was done in 2018, 2019, that also made a whole bunch of changes to the test procedure. As a result of those test procedures uh, changes, um, take the same piece of equipment, run it to the old test procedure, the new test procedure, 
most of the values are going to decrease to around 15%. Some of them could be less, could be 5%, um, some a little bit more, maybe as high as 20%. But there's a fair amount of changes to the VRF test procedure. And the result of that is DOE has given a proposed rule for both the test procedure and the energy conservation standard with both of those changes to take effect in 2024. So one of the big changes for the VRF is it will also go from uh, it is presently regulated by ER. In the future, it'll be regulated by IER, and those changes will go into effect in 2024. But what you can expect to see is some lower rated values for the VRF products. As a summary of all this, um, this little graphic sort of uh, <laughs> shows you all the activity that DOE has going on right now. Um, the words on the left, so these are um, when the rulemaking is expected to be final. So I expect, for example, that the VR, VRV for uh, VRF is going to be final towards the end of 2022. And the picture is when it goes into effect. So uh, this rulemaking will, will be published to final sometime late this year and will go into effect in early 2024. Uh, there's other rulemakings on three phase, five ton less air conditioner that we expect to be done. Uh, basically, the, what I may not have said earlier is all the stuff on the M1 test procedure, that is for single phase only, single phase five ton less. And there's a new rulemaking that will take those and also apply that to three phase models. That is expected to be done by the end of this year, maybe bleeding over into 2023, but it will go into effect in January 2025. And so if you, there's a whole lot of other changes that are coming out here. Um, as an example, uh, furnaces, uh, DOE has proposed that the minimum efficiency for furnaces will be 95% AFUE. So that will eliminate all condensing non-condensing furnaces, but that would go into effect sometime in 2028 or 2029, so depending upon when DOE uh, finalizes the, the rule. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch of changes that are coming in the uh, future. Uh, so we've got a bunch coming in 2023, but more is on the way. So I'm gonna shift modes from energy regulations to go into refrigerant regulations. Um, so where I'll start here is that uh, ASHRAE 34, uh, most of you may be aware of this, but ASHRAE 34 is the standard that classifies refrigerants. And there are eight different categories or classes of refrigerants. And those are the um, A3, A2, A2L, et cetera here. And the numbering system that ASHRAE 34 has is there's a lower toxicity, which is the number, the letter A, or a higher toxicity, which is the letter B. And then there's another, uh, the other character is numerical, and that is for the flammability. If there's no flame propagation in the test, then it's a one. If it's a lower flammability, which is a low flame propagation, a low LFL, low burning velocity, then it's referred to as a 2L. If there's a fairly high LFL and fairly high heat of combustion, then it's a classified as a two. And if there is extreme flame propagation, it is classified as a three. And so we have these um, four different, or sorry, eight different categories of refrigerants, A1, A2L, A2, A3, B1, B2L, B2, and B3. And again, those are all classified by ASHRAE 34. So um, to clarify a little bit of the difference between the 2L and 2 and 3s, this picture is um, a burning test of R32, which has a, a burning velocity of 3.9 inches per second. This test standard is actually based on metric, which is 6.7 centimeters per second. So we got to make sure we get the units right. Um, but this is a picture of a, R, a burning test with R32. So you do the same test with uh, propane and you get a different picture, right? So I think we all understand the uh, A3s, natural gas, and damages that can be caused by the A3s. Um, in case you didn't catch it last week, there was actually a, an explosion in a house in uh, Evansville, Indiana, that obliterated uh, a home and actually killed three people. Uh, that was expected to be a, a natural gas leak, but that's, that's some of the differences between a A3 and A2L. So, um, pretty low uh, flame velocity for A2Ls. And 
Um, as we look at the different refrigerants that are out there, there's a class A1, we're used to seeing like ARC-22, 410A, and, and 452A. Those are all class ones. And as you note, they actually all have a relatively high GWP. When you get into the class A2Ls, um, these are not the refrigerants that are in this area that have been thrown around. You've got R-466A, 452B, 454B, R-32. Um, these are all classified as A2Ls. Now, uh, 717 is um, ammonia, and that's a B2L, so it actually has a very low GWP, but again, it's a toxic uh, refrigerant. Um, as we move towards the A2s, like 152A, uh, that has a very, fairly low GWP, also a very high burning velocity and uh, can create problems with uh, safety issues, but it, uh, also, it has a lower GWP, but the uh, safety issues. And then when we get to the class A3s, uh, R290 is propane, R600A is isobutane. So when you get to these flammable, these uh, very low GWP refrigerants, then these are the class A3s. Um, so as I as you look at those, uh, the one thing I, I'm just throwing this, these are refrigerants that we've typically used, um, you know, R22, 407C, 410A, what we're using today in, in human comfort. And in chillers, you know, the, and refrigeration, there's these other refrigerants that are used. The big takeaway from this particular chart is that everything's an A1. So historically, um, for the last 60, 70 years, we as an industry have been using A1 refrigerants, which are low toxicity and um, no flame propagation by the test procedure. And that leads us a little bit to then to the EPA regulations and why some of the changes that are coming uh, are in process. So uh, this chart is uh, taken from uh, global sources, um, but basically what we're looking at is the, um, without any action, what we expect on this left chart is this high curve is somewhere in here is going to be the HFC emissions if we do nothing. Um, and then the Kigali Amendment itself, so the I think everybody's probably heard of the Montreal Protocol, which um, put a restriction on ozone depleting chemicals. Uh, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol puts restrictions on HFCs. So as a result of the HFC uh, Kigali Amendment, we see that there's going to be expected reduction in the emissions of HFCs. And what that amounts to is also a change in the surface temperature. So based upon science, uh, the expectation is that we will help by moving away from emitting HFCs. Again, it's not a phase out, but a phase down, um, that we see a very significant difference in the expected uh, surface temperature, keeping the change to less than a 0.1 C instead of a 0.5 C uh, by making this change. So what the Kigali Amendment does is it gives a phase down schedule. It's, again, it's not a phase out. It's still at the end. We're down to 15 to 20 percent of the baseline. The baseline years are set as 2011 to 2013. So the Kigali Amendment um, basically says that for more advanced nations, you start a phase down in 23, 24 time frame, have another big step in 29 and then a couple other steps out in the mid 2030s, whereas less developed nations do their phase down later on. Um, the US is in the non-A5 uh, earlier start group. And so as uh, this was part of the agreement, which is uh, included in the AIM Act, and we'll go into a little discussion on that now. Um, as far as the process is concerned, Canada and Mexico and 134 other countries. Actually, I think, uh, so I updated this in June. I think three or four other countries have now ratified. And I think the total number is up to 138 now. Countries have ratified Kigali, meaning that they're gonna keep to that chart from the last page. Uh, what's important for us is that here in the US, um, as the Kigali Amendment was done in 2016, the last administration did not push that as a treaty uh, to the US Senate to be signed. So several states got together and um, came up with the U.S. Climate Alliance, 
And those ones that are green are the ones that are taking action. So there was a EPA SNAP rules 20 and 21 that put restrictions on chillers and some refrigeration products that were, to go, were going to affect in 2024. Uh, due to litigation, those SNAP rules were reversed. Uh, these climate alliance state, states are taking action to adopt those rules uh, in and of themselves. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, previous administration did not submit the uh, Kigali Amendment as a treaty to the U.S. Senate. Uh, the good news at this point is that uh, it was submitted um, last year in November to the U.S. Senate. There's been committee meetings, and it came out of the committee in uh, May of 2022, and it's now in the process uh, to uh, be ratified by the U.S. Um, where that takes place, the, the AIM Act, uh, which was signed into law by President Trump back in December 2020, basically, which gives EPA the authority to regulate HFCs. Um, it, is, it is important for the U.S. for us to agree to the amendment because there are trade issues uh, that uh, still have some impact, even if we don't uh, sign the treaty. So as a result of all this activity, there's a whole bunch of regulations that are driving the refrigerant changes. As I mentioned, um, the first main bullet here is that the U.S. Climate Alliance states have taken action to adopt SNAP rules 20 and 21. Um, and those, most of those are final. So a lot of those uh, products are going to have to be using lower HFC refrigerants. California, through their California Air Resources Board, has issued a final rule in December of last year that set new deadlines for lower GWP refrigerants. Um, the dates, as you can see uh, on screen, the state of Washington is in the process right now of basically adopting what California has put into place with the exception of that they would not have any retroactive dates if they don't get the rule published by January, 2023. And there's also US, uh, the US EPA, um, after the AIM Act, there were several petitions submitted to EPA. They have granted those petitions. And in essence, what they do will be to uh, match California, except again, no retroactive dates. So a couple things to note about some of these regulations is, uh, so I've heard some clamoring. Uh, the GWP values are actually set by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They get together, these uh, science experts get together uh, periodically and assess, you know, take measurements of that in chemicals in the atmosphere and temperatures and a whole bunch of other factors and determine what the GWP values are for um, the various refrigerants that are out there. Almost all the regulations are based upon AR4, which is the fourth assessment from 2007. There was actually a fifth assessment uh, that was issued in the early 2010s and a sixth assessment, which was uh, issued last year that actually increased most of the values. The thing to note is that all of the, uh, the majority of the regulations, I think New York State is the lone um, standout is that everything's based upon AR4. So as you look at all these numbers, uh, please be mindful of whether actually there's a GWP20 value or GWP100. Uh, there's AR4, AR5, AR6. So please make note of what the values are. Uh, of note, this chart on the right is from the AIM Act. And as you can see, uh, the exchange values that are listed in the AIM Act are actually the same as the AR4 values from the GWP. So um, for example, R32 or HFC32 is a 675, uh, whereas the AR5 value is 677 and the uh, AR6 value is actually over 750. Um, so again, what all this leads to is that we're, what we expect is refrigerant regulations to require a GWP less than 750 based upon an AR4 value. And again, the CARB regulation is uh, final and packaged terminal air conditioners, uh, the things that you see in hotels or have a due date of January 1st, 2023, pretty much all the other products, uh, whether it's uh, residential or commercial, with the exception of VRF is uh, 2025, and the VRF products will be January 26 for CARB. And what is uh, proposed and EPA has uh, said they will accept, uh, we still have to do a final rule process, uh, but we expect that everything except VRF 
will be January 2025 and uh, the new products uh, VRF in 2026. So the refrigerant changes are coming. We've got the energy regulations in 2023. We've got uh, refrigerant changes in 25, 26. We expect more energy changes in 2029. Uh, but what I'd like to do is go into looking at some of the replacement refrigerants. I'm gonna try to zip through some of these um, so there's time for Q&A at the end. Um, this chart actually comes from NIST. And what you'll see is that with 410A as the baseline, there's a whole bunch of other refrigerants that can be utilized. Um, some of them have uh, lower uh, COP that's below this the horizontal line. Some of them have slightly higher COP. Some of them have slightly higher capacity, which is to the right of the vertical line. Uh, to the left of the vertical line is lower capacity. And you'll see that R32 is the one uh, loan factor up there in the upper right quadrant. R454B is, is close, a little bit more efficient, but a little bit less capacity. Um, and I'm just going to zip through these uh, next few slides so I can get to some things that I think are a little more important for the crew. Um, but again, these are the options that are being considered. Uh, 32, 54B, and 466A are the refrigerants that are being thrown around. Um, and so there's the AR, this chart has the AR5 values listed for GWP. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and zip through this. Um, one of the things to remember as we go to these new GWP refrigerants is that the big takeaway is that the uh, global warming impact, the blue bar is the, elect the, the darker blue is the electricity consumption. So this is uh, lifetime emissions of CO2 equivalent based upon some studies done by my company. Um, the huge impact is really the energy consumption. And so as we move forward with new refrigerants, uh, the, what the refrigerant do, does is reduce this light blue bar, as you can tell. So as what we say is that uh, not a huge difference between these uh, two refrigerants that have been selected as replacements um, as far as the net effects. Um, but what is a factor is that the, the total quantity of refrigerant has to be considered, not just the GWP value, because the CO2 equivalent is basically the pounds of refrigerant times the GWP of the refrigerant. So if you're using less refrigerant, um, that also decreases the CO2 equivalent. Um, as a sidebar comment, the R32 has basically been adopted as the, uh, for most DX systems globally, um, R32 has been the uh, refrigerant of choice as we move forward. Uh, I think this number is actually over, there's 160 million mini splits um, and other systems that have been installed globally. Um, to try to get through things, I'm going to go ahead and jump through some building code activity. because um, And this part is important for uh, specifically Texas and Oklahoma. As uh, we tip the typical process is when there's new technology, whether it's, you know, solar or heat pumps or refrigerants, whatever it is, usually they're uh, the process is you get re new revised product st safety standards. You get updated application standards like 15 and uh, ASHRAE 15. Those feed into the model codes, which are updated on a triennial basis. And then each state will adopt a model code. Um, what's important as an example for Texas, the Texas, most of the model codes, by the way, basically said that flammable refrigerants were not legal. So most state codes would not accept um, flammable products of flammable refrigerants, which most of the low GWP refrigerants are. So that's why this particular part is important. Um, so where we're at today is EPA SNAP rule back in 2016 allowed a flammable refrigerants for PTACs and window shakers. 484 was also updated to allow that. Uh, addendum D and Addendum H to ASHRAE 15 were adopted in 2018, which led to the publication of 15 2019 um, which did allow flammable refrigerants or A2Ls in certain applications. Uh, the product safety standard was updated with the third edition in November of 2019. And what that allowed, led to was some adoption in the 2021 model codes for flammable refrigerants. Now I've got that shaded red because while it allowed them, it wasn't really technically, it, while it was technically feasible, it wasn't economically feasible with the requirements that were put into place. So with the 2021 model codes, some of the states have adopted them. Uh, so, so for example, the state of Washington, state of Florida, state of Texas, 
have actually uh, made some adoptions. Uh, Texas actually, by the way, doesn't go into effect until January 1st, 2023, but the state of Washington, state of Florida now accept as well as six other states, uh, six or actually, I think we're up to eight or 10 states now, actually allow flammable refrigerants in their codes. But still, it's a very limited uh, application that you can have. Um, so that's why that particular block is, is mostly red. In the last year, there's been a whole bunch of addendum that have been published um, by ASHRAE 15 in our process, as well as a SNAP Rule 23 that allowed A2Ls for most um, comfort cooling equipment. And that's where we're at today. Um, the 2022 versions of the ASHRAE standards have either actually 15.2 was published in May, 15 itself will be published next month. Um, there's a new addition to the 2-40, which modifies the requirements to make it more economically feasible and, and more accurate. And those are leading to changes in the 2024 model codes, which uh, is specifically more the IMC as opposed to the UMC, but we expect uh, that box is green because the codes will um, have reasonable application requirements for the A2L refrigerants. And so what we expect moving forward is that most state and local codes will be modified or adopted to allow A2Ls. Um, the, what you see, this map shows that uh, most of the United States for commercial adopts the IMC code. Um, but what is important to note here is that um, all these states, so Oklahoma, I think is on the 2018 IMC. Uh, Texas actually allows the uh, municipalities to govern what they do. And it's pretty mixed here in Texas. I know the uh, city of Houston, I think the city of uh, Austin and um, city of San Antonio adopt the UMC, whereas other locations in Texas adopt the IMC. So you need to pay attention as we're trying to move forward with these products as to um, where, uh, what the specific code is in your area. Um, the red ones are the uh, UMC, which is released by IATMO and the IMC and IRC are released by the ICC or International Code Council. Uh, the next page is the residential systems. And as you know, still there's some, the gray ones are uh, local jurisdiction set. The blue ones are based upon the IRC. And again, even within the IRC or IMC, there's a variety of the version of the model code that is adopted. And California is the sole com uh, state in the nation that adopts the UMC for residential applications. Uh, moving forward with uh, safety standard development, I'm going to again jet through some of these. Um, the one thing to remember is that uh, the safety standards are based upon the, the fact that in order to have ignition, uh, you have to have the presence of oxygen, um, right, and as well as a fair amount of refrigerant, as well as an ignition source. So as we're considering these three things, and the fact that the minimum ignition energy for refrigerants varies depending upon what kind of refrigerant it is. The key point is that most of the A2Ls have higher MIEs than hydrocarbons. Uh, I think most people are aware that if you have uh, propane or natural gas, a simple electrostatic spark can ignite a hydrocarbon and cause a very big problem. Um, there's a research project that has basically proven that many household common, common household items like toasters, electric heaters, uh, hair dryers, and things of that nature will not ignite a stoichiometric mixture of A2Ls. So that's the big takeaway is that with uh, A3 refrigerants, it doesn't take much energy at all to get a, a fire started. Whereas with A2Ls, it takes a lot more um, energy to ignite. And as the safety standards were being developed, uh, this chart lists a huge plethora of research projects that were committed, uh, completed um, with a combination of HRI, ASHRAE, Department of Energy, California Energy Commission, and other stakeholders who spent over $8 million doing this research. And uh, this is not a complete list, but it's a, a lot of the bigger uh, projects that were completed that were led to um, putting in the requirements for the safety standards. So Big, three big takeaways for the mitigation strategies that were put into the safety standards is that you have to keep your refrigerant charge to a minimum. So the one thing that's very important is to know how much charge is in the system 
and verify that there is a minimum area that's met. Uh, as you're designing systems and installing systems, you can do things like uh, locating the equipment to minimize the piping. So if, if it's possible to have 20 feet of line set instead of 100 feet of line set, uh, that will minimize the piping and therefore minimize the charge. Uh, you can also do things like use two smaller systems instead of one bigger system. If you've got a, a big house, um, you know, everything's bigger in Texas, right? Um, so the, uh, instead of, you know, one big system, put in a couple smaller systems and that will help uh, with the application requirements. But the, the three big mitigation strategies are circulation, safety shutoff valves, and ventilation. So with these three mitigation strategies, um, the safety standards are set up where um, as long as you make sure that you meet the minimum areas that are put into the uh, installation instructions, then these uh, strategies, uh, the circulation is actually built into the equipment itself. The safety shutoff valves and ventilation itself would have to be put in in the field, um, but the would be operated by uh, refrigerant detection systems that are put into the equipment by the manufacturer, uh, either factory installed or installed as a uh, optional equipment. That leads us real quick to a couple of final slides. Um, what you, I think what you're going to see as a general rule of thumb is that with the products we have today, moving to 2023 with the efficiency regulations, you're going to see everything get bigger. And then as we go to refrigerant regulations in 2025, I don't expect to see anything, any physical sizes changes in 2025 due to refrigerant, but you're going to see a whole lot of label warnings. Uh, another example is as you today, you got a simple cased coil for uh, air for um, residential products, what you're going to see in 2025 is you're going to see wires coming out of these units because now you have uh, refrigerant sensors, you're going to have control boards that you didn't have in the past, and you're going to have a whole bunch of warnings and uh, EPA requires red marking. So that's what this red circle means. Um, and my last slide before we open up for any questions is uh, that there's, again, keep these things in mind as you're applying A2L systems, just make sure you have the minimum area. You know what the refrigerant charge is. You know whether the refrigerant sensor is factory installed or filled installed. Uh, if it's not factory installed and you're going to use uh, ventilation safety shutoff valves, you need to make sure that the refrigerant sensor uh, gets installed. Um, just make sure as, as we do today, we need to make sure that we follow in, uh, labels and literature. And as always, use caution. Uh, refrigerants even today can cause uh, you've got high pressure, you've got uh, refrigerant burns, chem, you know, the temperature issues, um, electrical issues. So we need to be careful as we install all products and be mindful uh, that the new refrigerants um, can be flammable. So make sure that you ventilate uh, well in any systems. So that's the slide deck I put together. I've been running my mouth for a long time. So I'm going to see if there's any questions. You can type your questions in the chat or the Q&A. What do you got? the refrigerant sensor and the shutoff valve what kind of you got an idea ballpark of cost increase for the manufacturer of these these new units is it significant or once you do it at scale not so much um i think the uh i, I can't speak to any specific cost but i can say that it will be a cost increase as to how much uh it it's a wild guess, but I can I can say it'll probably be fairly significant with okay. the um, with the new refrigerants and the things that manufacturers have to do to verify safety. Um, okay. All the additional, you know, the labeling, the sensors. Uh, there's pressure requirements. There's testing requirements that we have to meet in this product safety standard. It's almost certain that the product will be more expensive to produce, therefore, a, a increased cost to the consumer. Uh, Michael asks, will the refrigerant sensors be manufacturer specific? I, I would assume they would be refrigerant specific or, or no. Um, I, it, I can guarantee you that they will be manufacturer specific. So it is uh, extremely likely. Well, part of the safety standard requirement is that the sensor be approved as part of the product listing. So gotcha. man, manufacturer A may choose to use a different sensing technology than manufacturer B. Gotcha. And so uh, there will be a difference in sensors and it will be specific to the manufacturer of equipment. Huh. 
Yeah, that's yeah. Manufacturers, lots of changes. I have the the R and D. Y'all's R and D department, I'm sure, is busy, busy. Um, yeah. With, Ruben asks, is there any issue with the availability of these sensors? Are they manufactured in the USA only? Um, I there are domestic manufacturers as well as international manufacturers of refrigerant sensors. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know there are some uh, domestic suppliers who are working with manufacturers um, and there's also international suppliers. So I, I don't expect that we'll have a chip shortage issue with refrigerant sensors. Okay. Although I will say that refrigerant sensors have, you know, they basically give their feedback to a control board. So the sensor itself uh, may not have supply issues, but there are control boards which may have uh, supply issues. S supply issues, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, and just um, if give it another second for another question to come in. As far as your ICC CEUs, you will get a course evaluation from Kathy. Fill out that course evaluation, and we'll send you ICC CEUs. Um, then we, we won't be sending the slide deck out with this. This is uh, proprietary Daikin information on the slide deck. We hope to have to post the webinar on our YouTube channel in a day or two, just waiting on uh, clearance for that. Um, I don't see any more questions that have come in. Um, that fantastic job, Russ. It really kind of helped to, between adding this to what Benjamin did for us earlier, um, I, I think I'm a little clearer on, on some of these regulations. I, I, I think uh, I might have to watch it again, but uh, I, I'm well on my way, at least to understanding it. Yeah, well, we'll be happy. Uh, if anybody had, does have any questions, just feed them to Jason, and I'll be happy to answer any questions as we move forward uh, to, to what extent I can. Awesome, awesome. Well... I guess oh, one more, we had one more come in. Let's see. Oh, just uh, just congratulations and uh, thank you. And I will echo Michael's sentiment. Fantastic job this morning, Rusty. I really appreciate uh, you, you donating a little bit of your time for us at Spear. Uh, and thanks for joining us this morning, everyone. And we will, uh, hopefully Randy will be scheduling the next webinar uh, for next month, so. Hope to see you then. Thanks again, Rusty. You're very welcome. All righty. Bye, everybody.